Hey friends, my name is Jonathan Page. I'm the Director of Connectional Ministries for Innovation and Creativity, and I want to thank you for joining us for another edition of Before Conference Conversations. This is a podcast where we're looking at all of the legislative committees that are meeting at the upcoming United Methodist General Conference happening April 23rd through May 3rd of 2024 in Charlotte, North Carolina. And today, we are on our last of the committees. This is our uh, last legislative committee to talk about, but maybe uh, one of the most important ones. We're going to talk today about financial administration. Yes, this is budgets and all that fun stuff. So I am excited to be joined today by Jeff Mickle, um, a retired clergy person from the Virginia Annual Conference who's serving uh, on this committee, and Debbie Kelly, a layperson from the Virginia Annual Conference who's also serving on the Financial Administration Legislative Committee. Jeff, Debbie, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jonathan. Good to be here. Uh, Debbie, we'll start with you. Uh, I wonder if you might uh, tell folks a little bit about, you know, you're, you're a layperson. You serve in Northern Virginia, I believe, on the Northern Virginia District at uh, Grace United Methodist in Manassas. Uh, what is it about General Conference that made you say, hey, I want to give some of my time and energy to, to be a part of this work? Well, for the past 20 years plus, I've been working with youth ministry, and it's been an incredible journey. However, after the last um, general conference, I longed to have been in the room. And so um, I did some research and tried to figure out how I could make that happen in the future, specifically because I believe in youth and youth ministry ideals and ways to con continue to grow youth ministry. And I believe that is by being authentic and for us to be inclusive. And this has been my main goal. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. And here we are. Yes. And you're on the on the delegation. And uh, Jeff, you're, you're a legend in the Virginia Annual Conference, a, a longtime clergy person, district superintendent. Uh, tell us about your call to, to General Conference. So um, after the special General Conference in 2019, um, I could see that the denomination was at a real crisis point. Sure. And um, we were going to be looking for delegates to come to the next general conference in 2020, which <laughs> we're having next month. So That's right. <laughs> um, it's been a long journey. But uh, at that time, I um, was really involved with a lot of the things that were connected to the decisions of the of the uh, 2019 general conference and several people in, uh, said to you know you should think about going out for general conference and i prayed about it and i felt a nudge to say yes uh, you have things that you can offer so put yourself out there and yes. uh yeah they, they the um, members of the annual conference privileged me to be elected amen amen and and here we are all headed to, to Charlotte and, and just a little while. This will this will air just not too long before General Conference actually takes place. We're recording it at the end of March. So uh, we've got less than a month until we're, we're in Charlotte. So uh, as for financial administration, um, we've talked to delegates. Some, some have expressed a particular calling uh, to the work of the Legislative Committee to which they're assigned. I'm curious for you, Jeff, maybe you could lead off on this. Is, is this something that you feel particularly called to or uh, how how would folks know that uh, you came to the work of financial administration? Uh, well, the way it happened is um, the person who was supposed to be on the financial administration committee from the Virginia Conference was Tom Berlin. Yeah. And when he was elected uh, bishop, that opened up the slot, and I was put into that slot. I do have experience, though, with um, some financial administration stuff through the years, so it's not like um, in a place where I don't feel right. like I have some expertise to offer. Yeah. Right. I think it's a it's one of those that uh, you know Bishop Berlin is somebody who I think we all love and respect, and we're we're really glad he's in the position he's in, and and it's it, sort of the divine orchestration of things that somebody with your skill and expertise would would come in and be a part of that committee, and and I think that's incredible. And Debbie, for you, uh, I think somewhat of a similar story, right? Correct. We had um, someone that could not go to conference, and so I took their spot. And believe it or not, I have banking in my past. Yeah, and so some that. of this feels good. I know the wording, at least, and um, trying to figure out how I can best serve um, and do the best we can. Yeah. 
That's great. I think that's wonderful. Well, so as as you all have received the Advanced Daily Christian Advocate, you're looking through all the petitions that are coming before financial administration. I think, you know, like uh, most folks listening to this might assume budgets are a part of financial administration. I think we're going to talk about that. But if you um, if you all would just kind of provide for folks, what's kind of a if, if we were taking kind of a 30,000 foot view, is there sort of a general breakdown of how the legislation's flowing in this in this committee, kind of buckets that things might fall into? Well, just as I see it, I know that Jeff will be able to go in more in depth, but um, it, two main buckets, mm-hmm. the budget, mm-hmm. um, which of course um, has its own issues and ways that we have to try to live within our means mm-hmm. um, and be able to figure out how to um, invest as wisely as possible and then the other bucket is um about pensions um, Uh and that's kind of a big deal so um you know we have our hands filled um with these legislative um petitions that are before us sure and jeff kind of getting into the specifics we're talking about the idea of budgeting uh this isn't like we aren't setting the budget for every local church around the denomination by any means this is a, a general church budget correct right so um, in the local church, um, there's the, which, uh, you know, I've been involved with for a long time. Sure. There's a budget that um, covers a lot of stuff. Part of that budget in the local church is called the apportionments. Right. And within the apportionments, there's uh, district apportionments, there's annual conference apportionments, and then there's general conference or general church apportionments. Sure. What we're talking about now is the budget that deals with the general church apportionments. Very good. And so within that budget, is there anything that you might want to highlight for folks that are listening or watching kind of that may be a shift or maybe maybe something new that's coming in terms of the budget? Yeah, uh, big. So um, the reduction in the general church budget at, that is being proposed for right. this general conference is drastic it's uh, the largest reduction that uh, is in the history of the united methodist church in terms of from the 2016 general conference to this general conference uh, it'll be uh, like a 42 percent reduction wow Wow. um, if what is being proposed is what passes sure so two factors are behind that one is the uh, disaffiliations. Sure. And um, there's a strong commitment that we don't want the churches that have remained United Methodist to have to pay more right. because some of the other churches have disaffiliated. So we don't want the ones who have remained carrying a larger burden. Right. And there's also the, the factor of the pandemic and the yeah. fact that churches have been through a lot of uh, trauma and stress and ups and downs, and we're still coming out of all of that. So what's being proposed from the General Council on Finance Administration, and that'll be our starting point sure. at General Conference, is that we, re- we take out about 30% for factoring disaffiliations. Sure. So we remove 30% of the 2016 budget, just take it off the top. And then in addition, we reduce the apportionment rate right. by about 20%. Got it. So um, when all that is factored out, the bottom line is that the number that's being proposed for general church apportionments this year is about 42% less than it was what was passed in 2016. So that should mean that most local churches will not see any increase right. in their general church apportionments. Right. And I think that's such an important, there are a couple things that are really important that you just said there, Jeff, that, that might even be worth unpacking a little bit more for folks. One is, this is a proposal. Right. So uh, I think of, you know, folks that are watching this may be involved in their in their local church council or administrative board or something like that, where, you know, there's a budget proposal often from like a finance team or something like that. And then you work together to try to to massage that and come to, to something that you can then approve at your charge conference. 
um, at, at general conference. This is being proposed by the General Council on Finance and Administration for the denomination. And so would you walk us through a little bit about kind of how this moves from that proposal place to then what gets before the body? Uh, sure. So the GCFA, General Council on Finance and Administration, has a pretty elaborate process that sure. brought us to this point, sure. which includes a lot of input and data gathering and numbers crunching and... They uh, haven't just waved a magic wand. ...conversations with other right. parts. Of, so, But now they've proposed this budget, and it is going to be coming to the... A committee that Debbie and I will be serving on is called the Committee on Financial Administration. And that committee has already um, seen uh, the budget and we're uh, meeting in um, Zoom meetings. Part of the committees are meeting in Zoom meetings already, even before General Conference meets, to try to absorb what's uh, being talked about. And um, so this committee will all gather from all over the world and we'll have several days to analyze and uh, dissect and ask a lot of questions about mm -hmm. how did you get to these recommendations, and then we will make a recommendation from our committee to the whole general conference. And that then will come to the floor of the general conference for debate and whatever other um, uh, questioning or amendments or whatever may sure. come and the general conference will vote on a final budget, and that will be the final decision for what the budget is for the next quadrennium. That's really helpful. Yeah, and it, so it's quite an involved process, and, and there's a lot of time and energy, a lot of voices that, that come into that space. And, and the other thing you said that I think is so important about the proposal is that uh, you know, we're, we're landing at a number that will mean that local churches likely will not see an increase in their general church apportionment. I think that's an important thing for folks in Virginia, especially to be aware of, because Virginia, through disaffiliation that you mentioned, is now one of, if not the largest annual conferences in the entire connection, which means that we are now also moving up in our share of the apportionment responsibility. So, so that even where we might see a 42% decrease in the overall general church apportionment, we may not see that exact number in Virginia landed, and it's one of a couple of different kinds of apportionments that come through. I think that's that's so so appropriate and so important. And then the other piece that Debbie, you mentioned the bucket of pensions. Um, this is largely, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, these are the West Path proposals. Is that is that correct? And so, um, would one of you just be willing to talk for a moment about kind of the the direction of of that? Because we're we're changing a little bit of um, kind of the the direction in which pensions are going from what it has been to a new a new kind of. Um, I will defer to my cohort <laughs> um, because I am not a pastor. So sure. I have learned a lot and have and continue to learn more and more about this. Um, I, but I would like to say that it, sure. our pastors are um, really important and their pensions are sure. extremely important to the lay people. And so how we go about ensuring that their financial future is something that we um, can help them with is really important to For the sure. laity. Um, but I would, would you be willing to speak on that a little bit? Sure. So um, I've been around for a long time. When I first came into the church, the uh, pension program was completely called it was defined benefit 100 percent right, right. and it was based on the number of years you served and there was a certain dollar figure you multiplied by the number of years you served mm -hmm. and that's what your pension was and right. it was defined every year by the annual conference since then um, since the early 1980s there have been a number of pension programs that have come through the denomination and they have more and more moved from defined benefit to defined contribution. In Absolutely. other words, instead of the pastor being guaranteed a benefit that is defined by the church, now the church and the pastor are defined how much they need to contribute into a pension plan for that pastor. And when the pastor retires, that defined contribution is waiting for the pastor right. to um, 
draw on for the pension. So there's been kind of a hybrid system over the last 40 years. Some defined benefits, some defined contribution. And the trend has been to move less and less from the defined benefit and more and more toward defined contribution. So the proposal that's coming before this, conf this general conference is to have a 100% defined contribution pension plan going forward. So that means, if it is passed, that means beginning January 1st, 2026, mm -hmm. all pensions that are um, starting to accrue will be by defined contribution. Anybody who's serving right now will have mm -hmm. pensions that will be coming from a variety of sources right. and beginning with whatever they're putting in this January 1st, 2026, that portion of their pension will be all defined contribution. So uh, one more part of this is that the amount that's been being um, required to be put into the pension has also been gradually decreasing over sure. the years. Sure. So um, the amount that will be uh, in this new proposed pl pension plan the amount that will be required to be contributed in will be a little bit less than what is currently required. Sure. So what that means is that um, when the pastor comes time to draw the pension, what is required to be put in, the, t the total from that will be a little bit less mm -hmm. than it would have been of if course. we hadn't lowered this rate. Um, but there's also provisions for pastors or uh, clergy or even lay people who are, pen uh, who are participating in pension plans that the church sponsors to make their own personal contributions, right. which the church can match. And so it can even out in the long run, of but the plan itself is making a major step to become a 100% defined contribution. Sure. And I think a lot of the rationale from, from reading legislation around this is that this is about what the what the church can do moving forward. We want to make sure to follow through on the promises that we make to folks. Is that kind of your understanding as well, Jeff? Right. There's a desire to not make promises that we can't keep. Right. So, you know, you're talking about, um, you know, 70 years in the future, yeah. people who are serving now who live to be in their 90s and we're making promises today that those right. people will be expected to, expecting to uh, draw on. So... Um, and I think in the uh, secular world, there's been yeah. a similar movement away from defined benefits toward defined contribution for the sure. same kind of reasons that we don't want to promise things that we may not be able to actually deliver on those promises. Absolutely. And this, is, this wouldn't be the first time that we've made a shift. Like the, it, it, It's a new kind of shift, but I think about uh, coming to annual conference and seeing the line item in our apportionments for the pre-82 Pensions is in 1982. There was a shift, like, and there, and it's it's kind of been gradually moving in this direction. Since. Right. The pre 82, pre 82, it was all defined right. benefits, right. and the church got itself into a place where yeah. we were promising more than we had. So since 1982, we've been paying That's every right. year into the pre 82 fund right. in order to cover those promises. That's right. So we don't want to be sending that same burden <laughs> right. onto future generations. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And there's a lot of a lot of wisdom in that. So there's a it's a pretty heavy lift that y'all have in financial administration, a lot to walk through. I wonder, um, as you're preparing for general conference and just all this that's before us, Jeff, you kind of alluded to um, having some preliminary conversations, but I wonder, uh, maybe Debbie, we'll start with you. What What has your preparation been like for general conference, just in reading things and meeting with people, maybe praying once or twice? You know, what, what does that look praying like? Praying a lot. <laughs> yeah. I believe in the power of prayer, and that sure. is something I've been doing. But I also got together with a group of um, people from my church who are helping me read. I have like a oh, reading cool. team, and um, we've sort of set separated the legislation and they're helping me. Most of them are very well accomplished people themselves and sure. helping to give the cliff note version and then helping to re realize what it is, pray about it, and then come up with what we may yeah. kind of have a, a suggestion of how to, to vote or how to go forward. Um, I think that's a really cool um, thing that other delegates have been doing um, because it 
involves the church and Absolutely. other laity and other people who have expertise that can help a little bit. Um, and just while I have the floor for yeah, a please. second, um, you know, I would encourage anybody to start praying for the General Conference. Um, General Conference is something, this is particularly a year where um, some changes are going to have repercussions in the future. Sure. And how we um, allow the Holy Spirit to come in, in our midst and help us through these decisions is going to really make a difference. Um, and so I know of some prayer shawls that are being made. I know uh -huh. of a lot of different groups that are trying to do things to support the general um, delegation. But just bottom line is we all need to pray and Absolutely. keep that at the forefront. Um, decision making is difficult and, um, you know, Jeff and I are going to do our absolute best. But, um, uh -huh. you know, we... We also are two of many um, sure. from across the world um, that will be there and make helping make decisions. And I'm excited and a little bit nervous about sure. how that is going to happen because I honestly don't want to come home without having some concrete decisions being made. Sure. Um, so I'm hopeful. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. And Jeff, how about you? What's your what's your rhythm of preparation looking like these days? So. Um, we have a lot to read, a yes. lot of uh, reading material for uh, mater that we'll be expected to vote on when we get to general conference, right. all kinds of things. Not, uh, our committee, we're really focusing on making sure we understand that really well. But sure. we are expected to it. be familiar with what's coming from all of the other committees as well. So there's a lot of reading. Um, and we have also been meeting, as I alluded to earlier, mm -hmm. with this um, subgroup from right. the uh, financial administration committee that's been meeting by zoom since mm -hmm. last fall mm -hmm. and um, I think we've had monthly meetings since October um, and about um, uh, maybe 20 or 25 of us unfortunately we haven't had any international delegates it's yeah. all been US delegates sure because of a variety of factors but um, yeah we have uh, been able to uh, hear from one another and he get different perspectives on what's happening. Some of the people on that committee have been on the finance, on that subcommittee have been on the financial administration um, committee for, you know, many years and they know sure. a lot about it. So it's really helpful to understand their perspective. Sure. Yeah. It's, it's wild as, you know, we walk through all of the petitions when you add in what was before the 2020 uh, general conference before the postponement, now the postponed uh, items that include proposals since 2020. I think the total number of petitions is 1,099. I mean, that's a, and and we are all responsible for all of that. So, um, a lot of work there. But I think what you've both mentioned, whether it's groups from like our local churches, groups from within the connection, it's a there. There's one of the beautiful things I think about United Methodism is other than Jesus Christ, there's no such thing as a solo heroic leader. You know, we're all in this together and we realize it's a collective work. And, and I think it's beautiful that so much of the preparation reflects that. Um, Jeff, we'll start with you for this kind of last question. I wonder, imagine with me that it's, you know, the, the end of the day on May 3rd, we're getting ready to pack up our things and head home from Charlotte. Uh, what do you anticipate the story is that we're going to be telling as we leave General Conference this time around? Um, so I do think this is one of the most momentous general conferences in my lifetime, mm. if not the most momentous, we'll see. But what, what the season that we're in for our church um, is unlike anything that we've been through before. And the decisions that are coming before the general conference are um, talking about how to move forward into the future. So there's a lot of possibility to lay a groundwork for a really hopeful future for a denomination that can thrive all around the world and make disciples of Jesus Christ in many different cultures with great vitality and deep spiritual strength and tremendous witness for sure. uh, the love of God in people's lives. There's all kinds of potential for that to groundwork to be laid. There's also potential for um, things to not work and for yeah. it could be um, it could be a conference where there's a lot of disappointment. So my hope and my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will work in us and through us to make us agents of, of advancing 
God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven and that we can uh, be attuned and responsive to the leading of that spirit and um, and we trust God for the outcome. Amen. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. How about you, Debbie? What's your what's your hope? Ditto. Ditto. Um, <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> however, I do would like to just share that yeah. um, I really hope there's a lot of healing. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm praying that by making some of these difficult decisions, we will be able to um, heal as a denomination, to be able to put some of this behind us and move forward. Um, and that is that is extremely exciting and hopeful sure. um, and hope-filled um, because we need to get back to the work of the people and, the, and God's work, um, reaching out and loving one another. And I just pray that that is on May 3rd. Who I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think I speak for our whole annual conference when I say thank you so much for availing yourself to this work and, uh, and, and especially for today, for keeping us informed about the work of financial administration. Uh, I know we, I, I joined the two of you in echoing our call, like, please be praying uh, for our delegates, for the work that's ahead, for the work of the Holy Spirit, that we would uh, be attentive more to what God's up to than what we would desire God to be up to. And, um, and that through it all, we might be able to come come home with a renewed hope for for God's work and in through God's creation. So thank you all so much for being a part of this. Thank you for tuning in to all of the before conference conversations. While this is our last podcast before conference, we'll uh, likely have some opportunities to connect after general conference. And in the meantime, throughout the general conference session, we're fortunate that uh, we have 22 delegates from Virginia that'll be there, as well as other folks from Virginia who will be on the ground in Charlotte, uh, ready to share what's happening in lifetime and to reflect on it afterwards for all the information. If you want to continue to catch up on uh, everything that's coming up with uh, General Conference, you can visit our website, vaumc.org slash gc2024. Um, you can keep up with the social media pages like Facebook and Instagram for the Virginia United Methodist Church. And uh, more than anything, we, we just covet your prayers, covet this time to be one where we encounter the holy through one another and believe that we're going to come home a stronger church on the back end of this. So thank you so much for tuning in today and throughout uh, before conference conversations. We're excited to get to Charlotte, excited to get to work, and looking forward to sharing more soon. So be well, God bless you, and we'll catch you again real soon.